and, and debris. Um, so this makes post-fire landscapes more susceptible to flash flooding, mud and debris flows, and erosion. So now I'm providing some field photos to just give you some frame of reference for how those cartoons transfer to real life. So this is a picture of a pretty severely burned hill slope in the Cameron Peak fire. So you'll see little to no live vegetation left on that hill slope, a lot of bare ground and soil. And you'll also see that it's a pretty steep slope that drains right into a river with no riparian buffer. So any overland flow is gonna take ash and sediment and dump it into this river here. So this is an image of the river itself. You're gonna see a lot of ash and sediment that's been deposited along the stream channel. You'll also see some large woody debris from downed and dead logs. If you zoom in a little closer, this is what that ash and sediment looks like. So it's pretty dense and thick and it is cohesive. Um, so it creates a pretty big mess for a variety of reasons. Um, first being, as I talked about, little bit of rain can make a big impact in these systems given the hydrophobic layer so it can create flash floods and debris flows and so I'll show you this video that I think is pretty impressive just to give you some context it's a relatively small stream that's moving a lot of material and has a lot of energy you'll see a big boulder come down so it has the potential to move really large class sizes and so this can change stream geomorphology. So here is a picture following the Black Hollow flood. Um, this is probably like a 5'8 female adult for reference. So you, in some places in Black Hollow, they saw up to 20 foot feet of incision in this stream channel. That's pre-fire relatively small. You can also get erosion down to bedrock outcrops, which you can also see here. So this can cause significant downstream impacts to infrastructure and life safety, as we saw, unfortunately, after Black Hollow. It can also cause issues for infrastructure such as roads. This is a photo of I-70 following the Grizzly Creek fire. They had a series of debris flows that took out the highway uh, or portions of the highway caused many days of closure and they're still out there working on repairs. And also make its way to reservoirs and reduce the storage capacity of those reservoirs by filling it with sediment. Um, so in Cameron Peak, this was a big concern because there are multiple high elevation reservoirs within the fire footprint that drain some pretty severely burned areas. Uh, this really came to head uh, in the Strontia Springs Reservoir that serves Denver water. They had to do some significant dredging following the Buffalo Creek and Hayman fires. Uh, and that's a very costly exercise that a water utility would never want to get to the point of doing, but sometimes is necessary. Sediment can also impact drinking water treatment, both because you have to physically remove those particles, but can also increase the cost of chemical treatment as well. So for example, following the High Park fire, the city of Fort Collins was lucky and was able to basically just close the Poudre River intake for almost 100 days because of the amount of sediment coming through and pull their water primarily from horse tooth. And we saw a similar response to the Cameron Peak fire. But in places where there's no redundancy in the system, it can cause significant increase in water treatment costs. So we know sediment's a big issue, what can be done about it? We have a pretty large toolbox of post-fire treatments to help minimize uh, erosion and debris flows. Uh, and so the ones that I'll talk about today for the most part are aerial hill slope treatments. So that means they're applied with a helicopter to various hill slopes. So it can be done at much larger scales. So the first one I'll touch on is wood shred mulch. This is basically where you break down in the case of Cameron Peak, they used burned and dead trees that were local to the area, shipped them, and then used a helicopter to deploy them onto targeted burnt hill slopes. You could also use something like agricultural straw. This is a little bit less desirable because the straw is less dense, so it's more easily moved by the wind. And it also has the potential to introduce unwanted weeds or invasives, if not very careful. So it's a little bit less effective though a little bit less expensive than wood mulch. 
Hydro mulch is another option. This has kind of got less and less used in the past couple of decades, but it's a more synthetic approach. And then the last would be seeding. So that can be done in combination with mulching or on its own. And you would introduce native grass seed mixes to try and stimulate uh, surface cover growth <clears throat> in burned areas. You can also do individual structure level approaches. So this is a log erosion control barrier and a wattle or check dam. Um, these are linear structures that will be placed perpendicular to concentrated flow to help reduce velocity and store sediment, but they have to be installed. Many structures for a given hill slope to uh, basically ensure the redundancy in the system that these will be effective. They're also done and again at a structure level rather than like a full hill slope level, so they're harder to spatially model. So we did not really consider these in our modeling approach. So any questions on the terminology or process before I get into the modeling? Okay, I think we're good. Um, so now I'll get into the geospatial modeling component, which I think is what you guys are particularly interested in. I'll start by saying that this is a distributed model. So all of our inputs are gonna be raster products but we summarize it at various scales. So we can, one of the outputs or some of, many of the outputs can be displayed as spatially distributed rasters, but you can also summarize it. And we summarize it at the watershed scale often, just given the stakeholders that we work with. So we modeled specifically gross hill slope erosion. So there are other models that consider flood risk, debris flow risk, things like that. We specifically focus on gross hill slope erosion, and we use the Russell model. So that stands for the revised universal soil loss equation. And this has been around for decades. It's really widely used in scientific research. And this specific model uses five sub factors to predict gross hill slope erosion. Those include vegetation cover, soil erodibility, length and slope of the terrain, annual rainfall erosivity, and support practices such as aerial mulching. That fifth sub factor is only included when we get to the treatment modeling phase. We leave that out for the initial unmitigated modeling. So we first run the Russell model for the unburned scenario to get a baseline idea of what erosion would look like. We then use the classified soil burn severity map from the US Forest Service BEAR team, which stands for Burned Area Emergency Response Team. They get out in the field immediately following the fire, even during the fire to try and map or field validate the soil burn severity. And so we use the classified severity to make proportional adjustments to both vegetation cover and soil erodibility. We then rerun Russell to get the estimated burned erosion. We difference the two scenarios and then our output is potential post-fire increases and gross hill slope erosion due to wildfire. We can then apply hill slope sediment delivery ratios that come from field-based research, but they're essentially based on uh, distance from streams. So pixels that are further from a stream network are gonna deliver a smaller proportion of their erosion to a stream because there's more potential for storage along that flow path. So once we apply those ratios, that gets us to potential post-fire increases in net sediment delivery to streams. And then lastly, we can apply channel transport and routing information. That's gonna be based on stream order and slope. So larger streams that are steep are gonna have a higher transport efficiency of sediment. So that then brings us to potential post-fire increases in net sediment delivery to infrastructure. And we were specifically concerned with water infrastructure, things like reservoirs, intakes, pipelines, that kind of stuff. And like pretty much any model, we run a few different scenarios. We actually model six scenarios that are based on three different annual rainfall erosivity metrics and two hill slope sediment delivery ratios to provide a range of predicted outcomes that span kind of from best case to worst case scenario. The first map I'm going to show you guys is the classified soil burn severity map from the BEAR team. 
where red is going to represent your high severity patches all the way down to dark green representing unburned patches. Cameron Peak luckily didn't have huge contiguous high severity patches, but there were a lot of areas that had concentrated high and moderate. So you'll see kind of a clustering south of Highway 14 up here around Laramie River Road, a little bit around um, Roaring Fork here. So just take note of where you see a lot of yellow and red because those are going to spatially keep popping out in some of our subsequent modeling products as high risk areas. So this is the first product. This represents potential increase in gross hill slope erosion due to wildfire. This is going to be the highest modeling output, so the worst case scenario essentially, where the dark blue colors represent the highest potential increases in post fire erosion, and then the pale yellows represent the lowest potential increases. So, again, if you think back to that burn severity map, you're going to see dark blues in the areas that had a lot of high and moderate severity burn. We then apply those hill slope sediment delivery ratios and get a map of sediment delivery to streams. So this is the main difference here is you're going to see a constriction of that dark blue color to be closer to stream networks. So we can summarize this distributed information in a variety of ways, as I mentioned. Um, what I'll present first is at the NHD catchment scale. So these are relatively small catchments, smaller than the HUC 14 unit. And I basically summed the potential increase in sediment delivery to streams for every pixel within a given watershed and then divided it by the total watershed area. So we get per unit increases in sediment delivery to stream where the darkest blue watersheds are gonna be the highest risk or top sediment producing watersheds and the pale yellows are gonna be low again. I've outlined top 30 sediment producing watersheds in black and kind of generally labeled them. Um, so we saw, and I'll refer to these as our highest risk watersheds. And I say that with specific reference to erosion risk, um, but we saw high risk around Roaring Fork, Laramie River, Willow and Haig Creeks, Black Hollow, Little Beaver, and then down in that Southeastern flank, Miller Fork and Buckhorn. So again, these are gonna be our highest risk watersheds with the lens toward erosion. We can also do some treatment modeling to think about where can we have the largest reductions in sediment yield if we were to apply hill slope treatments such as mulching. Karen Peak Fire is huge, 200,000 acres. So you obviously can't treat all of that area. So we came up with some selection criteria to winnow down the area that we would even consider suitable for treatment. So based on the bear treatments catalog and some conversations with stakeholders, we came up with the following criteria. A pixel had to be burned at moderate to high severity in the Cameron Peak fire. Slope had to range between 25 and 50%. Um, we only included areas that had a pre-fire canopy cover of 10% or greater. And then the last one is a little bit of a caveat because we kind of ran two different scenarios. One where we included wilderness area and one where we excluded wilderness area. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, as I mentioned, aerial mulching was the preferred treatment for Cameron Peak. So that is the primary treatment we modeled. Based on literature, there is a effectiveness value of 70, about 79. So that means you'd see about a 79% reduction in hill slope erosion where mulching was applied. And then we used a mean cost of about $2,000 per acre. As I mentioned, wilderness was a really big issue for Cameron Peak. Um, this map in black, you'll see the top 30 highest risk watersheds still outlined for reference. But in green, you're going to see roadless areas. And then in that dark brown, you'll see wilderness areas. Those are national designations of land that essentially limit what can be done in those areas. And they're protected for conservation. But in a post-fire context, it's really hard to get any post-fire treatments on wilderness land. It's a little bit easier in roadless areas and they were able to get some treatments in roadless areas following Cameron Peak. Following High Park, they were able to treat some wilderness. So far, they have not treated any wilderness in Cameron Peak perimeter. 
So as you can see, with those top 30 highest risk watersheds, most of that contributing area is in wilderness or roadless. So this became a pretty big issue for this specific fire. So if you consider all of those treatment criteria we talked about, this is what you're left with, the land you're left with. So the green colors are going to consider that slope severity and canopy cover um, criteria, but they exclude wilderness, whereas the dark brown pixels will include wilderness area. So to provide some numbers, um, if you were to treat all suitable land in the perimeter, excluding wilderness area, that's about 11% of the fire perimeter. So that may seem small, but if you were to treat that much area, you're going to spend about $47 million. And for context, Cameron Peak response, they were more on the order of $10 million. So way too much area and not enough money. So they needed to be a little more strategic. Can't treat all suitable areas. So how do we prioritize where to start? So that's where we used this uh, kind of risk reward matrix. So the unmitigated modeling that I presented originally, that's what we used to identify the highest risk watersheds. But we also can use that treatment modeling and apply, essentially apply mulch to all of the suitable pixels within a given watershed to identify the highest reward watersheds. So we want to find where those two overlap, where you would have a watershed with high potential for post-fire increase in erosion, but you also have high potential for reductions if you were to apply hill slope treatments to all suitable areas. So that's what this map is getting at. Our top 30 highest risk watersheds are gonna be depicted in red. Our top 30 highest reward watersheds uh, will be shown in blue. And then where the two overlap, you'll see them in purple. So those would be, the purple watersheds would be logical places to prioritize effort and limited resources because high risk and high reward. So those, there's a couple around Laramie. I mean, all the same hotspots, Laramie, Willow, Hague, Roaring, Black Hollow, Little Beaver, and Buckhorn but you can see it further refines the scope. So that kind of summarizes watershed scale assessments that we did. Um, we also, one of the primary concerns following Cameron Peak was water supplies. There were several pieces of infrastructure that were fell within the fire footprint, which you can see here listed in the table, along with their associated water agency. So a variety of stakeholders and water resources were at risk. So, we worked with them to map the locations of all of their infrastructure, delineate the contributing area to each of those pieces of infrastructure, and predict potential impacts due to sediment delivery to infrastructure. So here is just a graphical summary that includes all of the infrastructure. So for something like Cooter Valley Canal, you're going to see six points associated with that that reflect our six different modeling scenarios. So we're able to essentially produce a graph like this to help water providers essentially triage kind of which infrastructure is at the highest risk. So I just listed them out on the right. That's the ranking of reservoir risk. And then on the left is risk to pipelines, tunnels, intakes, et cetera. And again, this is just from the perspective of gross hill slope erosion and sediment delivery. And then here is a map just to provide a little more frame of context for what that really looks like and how treatments were integrated. So right here, you'll see Chambers Lake. I have that hill slope erosion raster. Um, so this contributing area for Chambers, not all of it was burned. Um, so I'm only showing the erosion predictions for the portion that was burned. So here are the darkest red colors are gonna be the highest increases in erosion. The blues will be the lowest. On the left map, you'll see suitable area. So all of these black pixels will be suitable for treatment, excluding wilderness. There is a lot of wilderness area right here and here that could not be treated. Um, so if we were to treat all of those black suitable pixels, this is the change in erosion that you'll see on the right. A lot of that red turns to green, and I'll do one more time. So you would see reductions in erosion and therefore sediment delivery to that reservoir, but there is still a lot of untreatable area directly contributing to that reservoir that can be an issue. 
And now I'm gonna place our specific modeling approach again in a bigger, broader context. I was not the only one doing modeling. There were a huge collaborative network of scientists, managers, and stakeholders working together on this work. Uh, so to give you just kind of a frame for other products that were produced and used in the prioritization. Um, so I mentioned earlier the BEAR team that stands for Burned Area Emergency Response. They are from the Forest Service. They produced a soil burn severity map that pretty much all of the subsequent analyses used. Uh, CFRI, which is who I work for, did the hill slope erosion modeling. The US Geological Survey did debris flow modeling. JW and Associates Consulting Team did an assessment of road density and proximity to streams. Um, there was additional hydrologic modeling done by another consulting group. And I'm probably not even aware of additional models that went into it. Uh, so it was really important that we take all of these various data sets and synthesize them in some way so that managers had kind of a unified collective vision for how to move forward. So um, JW and Associates is a consulting group that was hired to do just that. They took all of these various assessments, put them in one larger assessment and created composite watershed risk index. So I'll show you, flash through a few maps of these various products. Um, so the first is gonna be burn severity risk. So this map scheme will stay the same for the next few maps, but they'll just be different metrics that are displayed. So watersheds with the most moderate high severity are gonna show up as red and then the watersheds that had a low burn extent or mostly unburned are gonna show up in blue. So highest risk will be warm colors, lowest risk will be cool. Um, so this is the spatial distribution of burn severity risk. Next product that went into the composite risk was debris flow. So you'll see, I'll toggle back again. This was burn severity priority. Now debris flow priorities look a little bit different. Next up is our hill slope erosion product. Looks very, much more similar to burn severity, but there's still largely agreement with debris flow. And then road risk was actually pretty different. It shifted a lot of the focus uh, east of the fire, just given road density in the area. So JW and Associates took those four kind of hazard rankings and composited them into one watershed risk ranking, which is what you see here. And this is the product that was really used by managers to make decisions about where to treat. So we see some familiar places like up around Laramie River Road, south of Highway 14 and down in this southeastern flank around Buckhorn and Miller Fort. Um, so there was generally good agreement. Um, so that is, was kind of like the, the final risk map to show uh, hot spots of risk was then one thing that was put into a larger treatment prioritization effort. So what I presented earlier was just based on our erosion estimates. JW and Associates did a similar prioritization effort that considered all of these various hazards. So they used their composite watershed risk index. They overlapped that with zones of concern, which were predefined before the fires and were really specific to water resources. Um, and then they use similar treatment suitability criteria and excluded wilderness area to land on a set of treatment priorities. So this is a map of the areas that were mulched since the Cameron Peak fire to date. Um, so in this bottom legend, you can see different phases, where they were focused, the acreage, and then the date they were completed. So you can just kind of see the progression of how post-fire treatment actually was applied on the landscape. Um, I will say this, is, this was done with a mixture of funding that had various um, restrictions on where and when and how it could be applied. So one quick example, phase one reservoirs, you'll see that up here around Barnes Meadow and Peterson Lakes, that was supplied by emergency watershed protection funding which states that you can only treat private land. So they use that to treat small segments of city owned property around reservoirs that could not have been applied to general forest service land. 
than something like Colorado Water Conservation Board money, which I think is what was used in some of this work, that can't be applied to wilderness area. It can be applied to federal land and oftentimes to roadless land. So these various pockets of funding do have kind of red tape and where and how they can be used. And I should also say that this mulching effort was a combination of folks, uh, City of Greeley, City of Fort Collins, Coalition for the Poudre Watershed, uh, were kind of the spearhead of that, but there were additional part partners at Colorado Water Conservation Board, NRCS, and Rocky Mountain Research Station. Um, so I'll I'm kind of flew through that, but I'll end here with a few lessons learned, and then we can open it up for discussion and, and further questions. Um, but again, I think it's important to put these GIS and geospatial analyses in broader context because it's not just a desktop analysis, this needs to be useful to people. Um, so here are some kind of general lessons that I learned from this process. And the first is gonna be importance of collaboratives and establish pre-fire relationships between utilities, emergency response teams, local communities, and so on. Following the High Park fire, the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed was established essentially to do just that, develop these relationships and they were absolutely critical in the Cameron Peak fire response. They were the ones who housed all the GIS data, who coordinated all of the modeling teams, who helped coordinate the utilities and the emergency response teams. So having a collaborative like that was, I think, key to the quick and seamless response for Cameron Peak. Second would be the need for centralized data hubs and pre-fire data collection. So while the fire was burning and shortly thereafter, as I mentioned, there were a bunch of different modeling efforts going on, different research teams getting out there, different burn severity products coming in from beer teams. And so it really fell on individuals and kind of organizations that probably weren't expecting that to be um, their responsibility. So for Cameron Peak, it was an employee of CPRW, Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed, who was coordinating all GIS data. For East Troublesome, it was the GIS specialist at Northern Water. So it's not necessarily people who are expecting that job up front, and it's generally pretty hard to manage all of those various parties and make sure their GIS data is shareable across boundaries. So I think that that is a big need that we don't really have a good solution for yet. And is prop, this is a prime group to kind of think through that issue to some degree. Um, next would be legislative and funding barriers. So as I mentioned, different pools of money have different restrictions on where and how it can be used. And so that kind of brings me to the fourth point that balancing the priorities of the funders, the implementers and community can be pretty challenging and those can be at odds with one another. So with that, I will put up a slide of additional resources in case this piqued an interest in any of you and you want to go do some research on your own. These are all great resources. And I'll open it up for questions. Thanks, Allie. That was yeah. great. Um, we haven't had any in the chat yet, but if you have questions, you can shout them out or put them in the chat. Uh, I have questions, actually. Um, and this is such a lame question, but I was wondering how you did, like what technologies you used for the modeling? Were you an R or ArcGIS model builder? Like, what were you using? What tools or packages? Pretty much only an R. And it's a pretty simple model in the sense that you have those five input rasters, but then you're just multi it's multiplicative. So subfactor A by subfactor B by subfactor C and so on. So you can do it all in like base raster in R. And then I did a lot of the vis visualizations in GIS. What other questions do we have? What? How do we not have any questions? 
Oh, here's a question in the chat. Yeah, I did have a question. Oh, hold on one second. Yeah, we had a question in the chat. Um, how you determined which areas were high reward for treatment prioritization? Yeah, yeah, sorry. I probably glazed over that a little bit. So first I narrowed in suitable pixels. So that followed that slope severity canopy cover wilderness criteria. And then essentially reduced hill slope erosions by or hill slope erosion predictions by 79% for each individual pixel. And then you can scale that up to the watershed scale by summing the reductions in erosion. And so the watersheds that had the largest reduction per unit area would be our highest reward. And that is largely driven by how much suitable land was within a given in it, within any given watershed. So watersheds that had a lot of suitable area tended to be our highest reward. So it's not necessarily per unit dollar, it's per unit area of the watershed, because that's how we were assessing risk. And then JW did it a little differently for the composite. Yeah, Allie, um, in regards to the treatment and the mulching, mm -hmm. how long does it take for that treatment to be effective for the next rainfall? Yeah, so the woodshed mulch would be effective as soon as it hits the ground. Seeding would take a while. Um, but yeah, the mulch itself is effective essentially immediately. And in terms of longevity, Woodshed mulch has a much longer lifespan of being effective than straw mulch would. But I will also say that a lot of the, at least like low and some moderate hill slopes already have grass cover back. So there is a decent amount of natural stabilization happening. Is, is there any alleys or any seeding incorporated with the mulching? Um, there has been on other fires. I don't believe they did that on Cameron Peak at all. There was talk of it early on, but I think they just went with mulch. But there was some seeding done after High Park, I believe. So what's the natural transition from mulching to stabilizing the slope? Is, is there planting going on or are we just leaving it up to nature or what, what happens? Um, it depends on the area. So typically post-fire planting is going to be planting individual trees. So I know they've been doing some ponderosa pine planting following Cameron Peak at the lower elevation of the fire. Um, but I am not aware of any grass seeding efforts that have been going on. But that's not to say it won't happen. But grass can, I mean, grass and trees can still reestablish even in mulch till slopes. Thank you, Ellie. And in fact, mulch should help because it can retain moisture. Okay. Um, and Robert, you had your hand up a moment ago. Did you still have a question? Yeah, Allie, did you uh, work with the region? Uh bear teams or the individual uh, districts or forests uh, bear teams and GIS people as far as communicating this data, getting data back, the results and, and then the rehab. Yeah, I worked mostly with Eric Schroeder. So he's the regional bear coordinator. Got it, great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, and he was involved in, so we did had a lot of like science and technical team meetings regarding all of the modeling that was being done, and he was on a majority of those calls himself. I know Eric. Great. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. And Rachel had a question in the chat about um, why, why we can't treat wilderness. So I'll let you answer it. Um, is it just Hold on. Is it just better to see how those areas heal without our help, or no matter what, we can't touch those areas at all? It has to do with national level legislation, is my understanding. Um, 
there, I mean, there have been exemptions. Like I said, after High Park, there was an exemption to treat some wilderness area and they were supposed to get a pot of money from, I think, Colorado Water Conservation Board to treat wilderness area in the Cameron Peak perimeter, but that didn't come through within the fiscal year. So I, I don't think it's never an op, like I don't think it's always a no, but it's hard to get a yes in wilderness area and it takes a lot of fighting. And I think it's much higher level legislation that is restraining that. Just to add to that on a related note for anyone who's been watching the trail restoration after the fire, um, the wilderness areas don't allow any motorized equipment. So even to remove giant fallen trees from trails, they have to go in with hand saws. They can't use chainsaws. So wilderness um, is just really restricted if you're not familiar with it. All right, thanks, Rachel. All right, any other questions? Yes. Okay. Allie, uh, in regards to um, the Cameron Fire area, when was the last time that was burned? Or had there been any, uh, what's the term? Describe, describe. Uh, set fires, controlled fires through that area. Yeah, so there were a number of prescribed fires within and around the footprint. Um, so those would have mostly been lower severity. Um, there were a handful up around Red Feather one in Roaring Creek, one in Dad Gulch, and then the High Park fire reburned part of it, reburned part of it. I mean, that essentially stopped the eastward progression, but there was a slight reburn in that perimeter as well. So there are a handful of reburns, be them prescribed or wildfire. Um, but there, I mean, there's a group of researchers looking into the effectiveness of pre-fire treatments and modifying wildfire behavior. And there's definitely some optimistic stories from Cameron Peak Fire. Um, so it's definitely something to, a very good question to bring up and something a lot of people are very interested in. Do we know what caused the fire? It's still listed as under investigation, but there were not reports of lightning in the previous weeks, so. Are there any fire towers in the area to first think, spot uh, potential fires? I think most, if not all, fire towers are out of or inactive. Sure. I think question. they're like starting to use remote sensing technologies more though for that thermal detection. Here's another question from the chat. Are we finding that the Bayer map is accurate for Cameron Peak Fire, specifically within the Big Thompson watershed? I know that area burned quickly and then snow fell, snow quickly fell after that area burned. That is a great question. Um, so, it's kind of a loaded question for me personally. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so a few things. You pointed out there were a lot of issues with getting good imagery and that based on the late fire season, it was really hard to get post-fire imagery from the 2020 fires because they went way into the fall and past snowfall. Um, so during the fire, there were issues with smoke. Once the fire was contained and out, there were issues with snow cover. So for I, th I think both East Troublesome and Cameron Peak, they mosaiced two post-fire images to get cloud-free, smoke-free, snow-free imagery as best they could for the full fire perimeter. So that's the first caveat. Um, second being, I think the snow cover limited the scope of field validation for all of these. Um, so I know for each troublesome, the bear team actually went back the following year and redid their ground surveys and I mean like exponentially increased their number of observation points for that fire and produced a new map and it changed quite a bit. They 
there were two versions of Cameron Peak soil burn severity, and there was talk of having a third, but I think it stopped at the second. But there are research teams at CSU, um, I know Tony Borster has worked on it, where they have actually gone back and did a bunch of CBI plots and redid the soil burn severity maps. And I think that they have much greater performance, but you have to understand also that bear teams are constrained within, I think it's like seven days once the fire is contained is their window to work. So they have to do it fast and get a product out there. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is that soil burn severity is different than vegetation burn severity. So satellite imagery often captures vegetation consumption better than soil consumption, whereas something like hydrologic modeling or erosion modeling or debris flow modeling, we really care more about soil and soil burn severity. And that's really hard to capture well with satellite imagery. And it's very variable over space. So I just danced around your question a lot, but I mean, it's, it's a useful product, but it's not perfect. I have another question from the chat from Anne. Um, regarding the first lesson learned about collaboratives and pre-fire relationships, for CWPPs, community wildfire protection plans, and FMPs, I don't know what those are, were they used and were they useful during the modeling and treatment funding efforts? Yeah, so I, I wasn't really aware of them during the immediate planning, immediate post-fire planning. I am aware that a lot of communities are redoing their community wild, wildfire protection plans now. Um, so a lot of those are out of date or like 10 years old or so. So I actually don't have a great answer to that, at least in terms of the immediate post-fire response. I know that there is renewed interest in making sure those are up-to-date and accurate. Um, one more question from the chat. Is anyone doing debris flow mapping as well on this area that communities can use for their hazard risk management? Absolutely, yeah. So USGS, which, so the you know, US Geological Survey did their own debris flow probability and volume mapping. And you can find that, I believe if you go through InsoEye, you can still find it, or you could just go onto USGS website directly. Uh, but they absolutely did it for all the 2020 fires. And that was one of the inputs to the composite risk product. And I can show that map. This is the like watershed level debris flow risk map. There's nothing in the chat, so okay. Um, well, I think we might we might be done. Which this is a record. We never finish like on time. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, this was fantastic, Ellie. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you take a look at the chat. There's lots of thank yous to you in here, and yeah, thank you so much. This was really interesting. Um, oh, it looks like Vanessa just sent a link to an article about fire spotting in Montana, so that would be a cool thing to look at. But yeah, thanks so much for everyone and for your time. And like, I'm going to make my students all watch this recording now because I think it's really awesome. Cool. Uh, yeah. Those so check that stuff out. I know you guys are involved in the Cameron Peak story map, but those story maps yeah. were really so, helpful. <laughs> The student, the young woman who made that story map was sitting right here. She's over awesome. here. Awesome. Yeah. Well That's done. Thank you. Um, yeah, Beth, super tools. And Beth, uh, let's uh, just replug the two uh, social justice positions that the Forest Service just released for the yeah, senior and junior right. analysts. I <laughs> yeah, if anyone, if any students are graduating, uh, there's a a uh, bachelor's required and a PhD required internship with the Forest Service. We just posted it on our listserv. It's also on Twitter, under GIS jobs, under us. So you can find those really great opportunities, mapping, mapping environmental justice with the Forest Service.
if you're looking for a job for January. All right. Um, yeah, so I guess we'll wrap up. Have a great day. Enjoy the fall colors and the little leaf tornadoes that are going all over campus. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys. Cheers. Thanks. <laughs>